I want to welcome everybody to this webinar on behalf of CDS. We had over 150 people who registered for today's seminar, and we're so glad that you are here. Um, we've made a little change in the technology this week uh, from the first three webinars, and that is that we only have voice privileges for the presenters, and uh, we're hopeful that that will cut down on the background noise and we'll all be able to hear better. Um, we will have an evaluation at the end of the session, so we welcome your comments on that evaluation, particularly around this change. But any, any other comments, uh, we've been very uh, gratified with your suggestions. This is the third in a, or sorry, this is the fourth in a series of six webinars. There will be another one next week, same time, uh, presented by Pete Davis. That will be on uh, market research, projecting sales p potential, and finding the right site. Um, we hope that you'll register and come to that one as well. And before we begin, I want to tell you just a little bit about CDS and our work. Uh, CDS is a cooperative development center uh, focusing on the upper Midwest with offices in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Madison, Wisconsin. We are uh, one of a number of development centers around the country. And uh, we hope that you have found contact with the one in your area. Um, if you need assistance with that, be sure and let us know. Or you can go to National Cooperative Business Association website and uh, find your co-op development center there. Um, CDS also houses uh, 16 independent consultants who specialize in food cooperatives. And we work with cooperatives uh, across the country in all regions um, through our parent organization, uh, the Upper Midwest Development Center. Um, what we have noticed is that there have been a, a recent new wave in co-op development. We've gotten a lot more phone calls and inquiries from people in communities who want to have a food, food co-op. Um, this is mirrored. There's been a couple of other eras of food co-op development in the United States. One in the, uh, in the 30s and 40s uh, where a number of food co-ops were formed in response to the needs of the time. Uh, the Depression, um, rationing during World War II, rural communities needing a food store. But fewer than 10 of those remain today. Then in the late 60s and 70s, there, were an, there was another wave of food crop development. Some estimates are as many as 800 food crops formed in that time. Uh, they were part of the social change movements of those times. And over 250 of those have survived, and many of those are thriving today. And then in the last 10 years, we began to see another wave, and you all on this call are a part of that wave. Um, as we began to see those inquiries happen, we joined with our partners, National Cooperative Grocers Association and the National Cooperative Bank, NCB, to form Food Co-op 500. Food Co-op 500 has a vision of supporting um, food co-ops so that more and more food cooperatives successfully serve their members. Uh, we hope to provide the resources that will make it more likely that startup efforts that you all are a part of will be successful, that you'll get open for business, and that you will be around for the long haul. Uh, we want to share with you some of the successes and failures that we've seen from the other waves of food club development and uh, support your efforts. So this, this webinar is a part of that, and we once again welcome you. Um, I want to introduce Stuart Reed, who will say a few words about Food Club 500. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Food Co-op 500 is dedicated to providing support, resources, and advice to all of the organizing groups around the country who want to create a new retail food co-op in their community. That's a big ticket, and we do the best we can, but part of what we do has to be uh, in terms of providing resources to large groups at once, like through these webinars and our website, other tools. So we strongly encourage you to check out our website, which is foodcoop500.coop, because there's a that will always have links to what's happening in our world and advice and, and uh, resources that you can use in your work. But also, don't hesitate to contact me at any time that you have questions that aren't already answered, and I will do my best to point you to the right uh, help that you can use. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there and turn it back over to Mark, I believe. Hi, yeah, Mark, will you say a few words about how the webinar is? Yep, good. I just have a couple of technical uh, points to make. 
One is that we're going to be using the written uh, question and answer process uh, to uh, receive your questions. So in the Go to Webinar toolbar that um, hopefully is on your screen, there's uh, one one line that says question and answer, and it might be collapsed, uh, in which case uh, click the little um, right-facing triangle, and it will um, open up and expand. And underneath, enter a question for the staff, you can type uh, and then hit send. And Stuart is going to be managing the question queue. And uh, we very much want to um, hear your questions. And Bill will be um, fielding them, and, and Stuart will be providing them uh, during the session. Um, again, if you're on the call and need help um, accessing the GoToWebinar, uh, you can email me at first and last name Mark Goring, M-A-R-K-G-O-E-H-R-I-N-G, at cdsfood, F-O-O-D, dot C-O-O-P. And, um, and then the last note is just that we will have the um, webinar evaluation that comes up at the end of the session. And um, it does take a minute to load, so please kind of expect that. And if you can linger and, and provide your input, we really appreciate it. Um, that's it, Marilyn. Okay, cool. Um, the, web, the materials for today's webinar are also available on the website, and we are making a recording, which we will make available for those of you who would like to hear it or share it with others in your group at another time. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Bill Gessner. Uh, Bill has been working with food co-ops for uh, a very, very long time. I'll let him tell you exactly how long. Um, but he has uh, a depth of experience that I think is unsurpassed. I don't think there's anyone in the country who has more experience with food co-op projects than Bill Gessner. So you are very fortunate to have Bill um, giving you some of his wisdom today. And, um, and uh, he's also um, uh, available for more in-depth services uh, at, a, at another time. So Bill, would you take it away? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Marilyn. Uh, that's a pleasure to be with all of you today in this uh, rather large room that we're in, but we're all going to try to focus on the computer screen or the printouts if you have those instead of the computer screen and then our conference call. As Marilyn said, I've been doing uh, working with co-ops for a long time. Uh, years ago, I managed a very small uh, retail food co-op uh, and then uh, managed a worker-owned uh, cooperative wholesaler for a number of years and for the last 20 plus years I've been doing consulting work with food co-ops focusing primarily on existing co-ops uh, helping them with expansion and relocation projects and second store projects both the planning and implementation of that and uh, of course there are a lot of similarities between those projects and the startup projects that all of you are involved in and so in the last um, four or five years I've done increasing work with a number of startup projects around the country. Uh, the first webinar that we did on January, um, the first week in January, January 9th I believe, um, focused on the uh, four uh, cornerstones and three stages and an orientation to that development model. And the primary thing that we looked at was what I would call a timeline for a project that was represented by the three stages. And uh, today's webinar is going to focus on the other, what I call, primary tool for your work. Uh, the other tool, in addition to a timeline, is a budget. And how do you begin to develop a budget as you're starting out in your project? And hey, Bill, so, could I just interrupt? Could you um, speak a little more loudly or into the mic a little bit more? Yes. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the agenda we have today is going to, uh, first of all, look at a sources and uses development budget, uh, looking at it, the overall budget for the whole project, and we'll take some time for questions in that first uh, 30 minutes, and then we'll break it down by the different stages. Stage one, stage two, <clears throat> stage three, and the sub-stages. And then we should hopefully have some time for questions and discussion after that. So if you can move on to slide three. Mm -hmm. 
just say that today um, uh, I wanted to focus on the three learning goals for this webinar, and that is to, number one, understand the format and the function of a sources and uses budget and how that relates to and fits in with what is referred to as a financial performa. Um, so we will explain that as we work through this. The second goal is to understand the sources and uses budget within the context of the of the development model that Food Co-op 500 is is advocating the four cornerstones and three stages model. And the third goal is to understand the key decision points that are involved related to member equity and member loans. Uh, when, as your project proceeds, you will raise member equity and you will probably raise member loans. At what point do you put those dollars to use? At what point do you put those dollars uh, uh, to, to risk? You, you risk those dollars as you're attempting to get your store open. And it's important to understand where in the process the member equity comes in and where in the process the member loans come in. So these three goals are what I hope we can uh, come back to at the end of our webinar and see if we've been able to provide some understanding around these goals. Uh, I should also say that, that today I've invited uh, uh, four of my colleagues uh, at CDS to assist me in this webinar uh, and to, you know, interrupt me if they if they would like to or to ask questions uh, or to, to make a point related to the presentation, and that will hopefully serve to break up my voice. Uh, so we'll have, um, you know, some other participants here. Uh, Denise Chevalier, uh, and Denise, if you can uh, say hello here in a moment, but Denise is. Uh, does work with CDS and does provides project management services and project management support services and also works with me on the financial performance. So Denise will be um, participating from time to time. Denise, would you like to say hello? Hello. I had to unmute because I was talking to my line. But um, hello, and I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to uh, be here and and to uh, walk through with the rest of you on this um, on this webinar and introduction to the budget and the pro forma. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, you've heard from the other three people, uh, Stuart Reed and Mark Goring and Marilyn Scholl. I've also invited them to feel free to uh, interrupt or make comments as we're going along. So hopefully you'll recognize their voices as we're, we're going along. Um, the uh, steward will, as, as Mark said, will, will be fielding your questions and channeling those to me as he, as he thinks is appropriate. So uh, moving on to page four, uh, we, we can go back and, and just a very brief refresher of the of the development model that you can find more information on at the Food Co-op 500 website and also at this link uh, below here um, and the, the four cornerstones and three stages. Uh, four cornerstones, the primary ingredients for uh, developing a food co-op identified as a vision talent, capital, the system, and uh, the three stages moving through there, beginning with the organizing stage, stage two being the feasibility and planning stage, stage three being the implementation stage. Uh, scroll down to page five. So this is an overview of the three stages. And what's important in this illustration is to understand the, the dotted line uh, after stage 2B 
and what that represents, and then the solid line after stage 3A. Uh, the dotted line after stage 2B represents the point where the co-op secures a site with contingencies. Uh, they secure a site with a lease agreement or a purchase agreement and contingent upon, and usually the primary contingency is contingent upon getting full financing for their project. Uh, of course, there are some situations where market conditions are such that you're in competition for a site and it's very difficult to get a, a contingency, but you want to be planning as such so that you are aiming to get a contingency and you do as much of your work even beforehand in the event that your contingency is not available or that it's a very short contingency. Typically, you would want to have 90 to 120 days at least for a contingency period to get your financing in place. Um, some conditions, some situations might not allow a contingency or might only allow you 30 days or 24 hours or whatever. But um, hopefully, in most situations, you would need, you would have you know, 90 days or, or such. Then you move into stage three, which is the pre, stage 3A, the pre-construction period, which is primarily design work, and then launching your, your financing drive with your members for member loans and getting bank loans, et cetera. And when you pull all of that together and get all of your financing together and all of your design work together supported by bids that uh, fit with the financing commitment you have, then you're at a decision point, which I call the final decision point, the no turning back decision point. And so once you cross over that line between 3A and 3B, there's no turning back. And so those decision points uh, illuminated by the, the dotted line and the solid line are key that you understand those. And your project, as I think I said back in January, your project will do all it can to resist this timeline. Um, and it's your job to try to impose this template onto the specific uniqueness of your project. And uh, that takes practice and, and discipline. But uh, it's, I think it's been demonstrated that it's important to work through this timeline and this sequence rather than getting out of sequence and, for example, committing to a, a site uh, without contingencies before you have your financing in place. Uh, so those are just some, that's an example to look at. Moving on to slide six. Um, we can look at the same overview, but I've attached some estimated time frames for each of the stages. And you'll notice with stage one, the organizing stage uh, shows six to 12 plus months. So any of these stages can certainly take longer than what is shown here. But altogether, these add up to a time range of you know 19 to 37 plus months. Um, a little bit more than a year and a half to three years to work the way through the three stages. And then if we can move on. Next slide. So this again shows that overview uh, with what I'm calling key decision points that mark the end of each stage. And we won't spend any time looking at this in detail, but you can, the blanks that are shown in each stage, like in stage one, organizing organization is formed with blank members. You're suggested that you identify goals for the number of members that you have at each of those places where there's a blank. And later on, or other places in the presentation, we suggest uh, goals for a number of members for a specific scenario for a co-op at a certain size that for example, should have 300 members at the end of stage one. And uh, at the end of stage 2A, they have 450 members. At the end of stage 2B, to have 600 members. 
the end of stage 3A, they have 800 members. And the end of stage 3C, just prior to opening, to have 1,000 members, or at least within a couple months of opening, to have 1,000 members. So we can move on. So getting into the sources and uses development budget, um, what is it? We'll soon illustrate this and show an example of this, but I just wanted to highlight a few things here that the sources and uses development budget is a one page financial picture. And once you've worked through this and have a sources and uses development budget for your co-op, I think you have a better picture of what you're aiming to do uh, in terms of uh, raising funds and spending funds. The sources and uses budget includes a listing of key assumptions, lists the uses of funds, the sources of funds, and magically, somehow or another, the sources need to equal the uses, and then you'll work through many drafts of this, you know, dating each draft. So, moving on to page nine. Um, the source and use of budget is a key management and communications tool for your leadership group. The goal is to be conservative and to estimate costs so that you won't encounter unpleasant surprises as you go forward. However, listing a, a use of funds and saying that you're going to spend $100,000 on this particular thing does not automatically give you an open allowance to spend that money, that you still need to practice cost containment as you proceed through the project. Uh, without jeopardizing the end product, the quality of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you, will need to, you will need to spend money to achieve your goal, and you'll probably need to spend quite a bit more money than you would initially think. So in that sense, creating a source and uses budget is a stretching process. Uh, we work through this exercise, and some people are certainly overwhelmed by the, <laughs> the numbers that we end up with. Uh, creating a co-op costs more than you think. So uh, I invite you to participate in this. Uh, it is an exercise, and uh, we're, we'll work through a specific scenario to try to give you a, an illustration of what this might be, and then you, you know, can begin to do that work for your own project. And certainly there are those of us who can assist you with it as you proceed. The sample that we're going to be looking at has been developed based on what we view as a typical scenario for a startup food co-op. Uh, your project and your experience will probably vary and could vary widely from what we're showing, uh, yet the sample in our view represents a typical range. Uh, so the, you will be able to find the sample uh, online. Uh, it is shown as an Excel document, and there are tabs in the in this. But we, you don't need to go to that at this point. We will uh, be showing that here in just a moment. Mark, if you can go to the first tab. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. And I'll invite any of my colleagues if they want to comment or uh, ask a question at this, for a moment here. Yeah, Bill, uh, while well, he's loading that up, I just wanted to comment that as I've worked with different groups using the sources, and it's actually pretty amazing how accurate they tend to be. The early versions end up being pretty close if they're well developed. So uh, it's a great tool. Yeah, it is. It is um, surprising. A lot of times, groups will say, "Well, we can't. We don't know these costs until we get quotes and." You know, it's too early to figure this out, and I always say you can do uh, you can create a sources and uses budget on the first day of your project, and uh, it's, it serves as a tool and a guideline for you as you as you go along. So, um, 
So starting with uh, this, I want to emphasize at the beginning that you'll see on line uh, four uh, that this scenario is um, will need to be tested with a financial performa to determine if the scenario is financially feasible. Uh, a financial performa will project the first five or ten years of your store, its performance from a income statement or in other words a profit and loss statement uh, as well as projecting a balance sheet and a cash flow and also a debt service schedule uh, for you know five most likely ten years uh, to determine if there is adequate cash flow to service the debt that is shown in the sources and uses budget. So the sources and uses itself does not demonstrate financial feasibility, uh, but it is a beginning to the financial planning. So the key assumptions that we're looking at here very quickly, uh, we're looking at a store uh, retail square feet of 4,000 square feet, uh, total square feet of 6,000. Retail is typically somewhere around two-thirds of the total space, you know, range 65 to 70 percent. And projected sales, which you would will, if you haven't if you haven't had a market analysis, uh, it's recommended that you would have one. But you don't have to wait to get market analysis. You can create the, the sources and uses and the financial performa before that, and then just simply take the findings from the market analysis and plug them in to your financial performa. Here we're going to make a very conservative threshold assumption of sales of $400 per retail square foot, uh, 1.6 million for year one. Uh, the lease rate, uh, this is a lease situation. We're showing the lease rate at $12 a square foot plus costs for real estate taxes, insurance, common area maintenance, all that adding up to a total of $14. And or fifteen dollars and fifty cents. Uh, so that's the total, you know, occupancy costs uh, aside from utilities, and that will vary widely in different parts of the country. But uh, that's maybe an average of what we're what we're seeing. Uh, looking at off-street parking, uh, what is the off-street parking in the particular scenario we're looking at? We ideally like to have at least six spaces per thousand square feet of retail space, so we're showing 24. Uh, we're projecting a date of possession of the site of April 2009, a little bit more than a year uh, from now, and then after construction and renovation, open for business in August 2009. So those are the key assumptions that frame, give us a framework to build the sources and uses. Uh, the uses going down, beginning to look at that. If you could scroll down a little bit, Mark, get the full uses in front. There we go. Um, we begin to list out the items that where you will use funds for. And uh, starting with, in this case, since it's not a purchase situation, but a lease situation, what are the leasehold improvements uh, in line 28? Um, the leasehold improvements are factored at a, we're assuming at $70 a square foot. Uh, this is the area that's most often underestimated. Uh, groups might begin thinking that they'll spend 10 or $20 a square foot. Uh, we're seeing the cost in this area go up dramatically in the last uh, four or five years. Um, so I've seen uh, leasehold improvement costs of $130 a square foot. Um, you might say, why not build new construction if you have to do that? But it, it is, it's getting increasingly costly to do this type of work, the renovation work. Uh, so we're grabbing the number of $70 a square foot times the 6,000 square feet is 420,000. Uh, similarly, with other items like equipment, uh, we've taken a per square foot number, uh, multiplied it times 6,000. Inventory, we've factored a little differently, $40 a square foot times the retail square foot, so $40 times 4,000. 
then the, we come to an area called fees, which includes consultants, architect, engineer, store design, legal financing, a whole variety of things. Um, we typically, initially, we'll estimate fees at 12% of the above costs and then add an allowance for project management. So that's how we end up with $145,000, $146,000 number. Um, we'll, in the second part of this, we'll break that down and show what some of those fees might be. But uh, in the next item here, uh, trying to give you an, uh, the, the co-op will have an allowance. You suggest that you budget some type of allowance for your basic expenses that you'll occur in the years prior to opening your store. So small amount is basically $5,000 a year for what you might call admin expenses, miscellaneous expenses to build your organization. Um, startup promotion is an allowance for uh, promotion dollars before opening day. Uh, you can spend some of that on at the onset and the organizing stage as you're trying to build interest in your community, but most of it is spent you know, prior to the store opening. Startup staffing is, uh, is an amount that's calculated to allow you to hire staff prior to opening, and especially uh, a general manager uh, you know, with benefits at least six months prior to opening, uh, recommended even longer than that, you know, six to 12 months prior to opening, the longer the better. But the challenges of the timeline and the funding are, are something that you need to deal with on that. Holding and uh, site costs are, any, are site related costs prior to your opening day. They're listed there in terms of lease deposit. Um, if required, you'll try to negotiate your way out of a lease deposit because you're going to be renovating and putting so many dollars into the space. But as a startup group, it's, it's probably likely that you'll have to do a, make a lease deposit. Uh, but then if there's any rent or taxes or insurance or utilities before opening, they need to be estimated and calculated there. Uh, you also have an interest expense on debt that you borrowed and used prior to opening. So the interest expense is calculated during, during the project. Uh, the post-opening professional support, this is a new line item that we're adding to the template that we didn't have in the earlier version that some of you may have seen that was uh, posted about a year ago. But as we're working with groups that are starting up, we're seeing there is an important need to have um, professional consulting support once the doors are open. And usually what happens is by the time you get the doors open, you're, you know, it's such a challenge to keep things flowing day by day that you, and, and dollars are getting tight that you don't have the time or you have not previously planned to commit dollars for professional support. So it's being suggested that this be part of the uses for the project and be a set aside. And we just picked this amount. Uh, it may, it would vary depending on the co-op, but the higher, having a higher amount is probably better than having a, an amount that is too low. So we initially settled on $30,000 here. Working capital allowance is, uh, designed to provide adequate cash flow to cover initial operating losses in the first year or two. Uh, and so that's initially factored at 4% of year one sales. But once the financial performa is created, that number can be modified to make sure there's adequate cash flow. Then we add all this up to a staggering subtotal of $1.3 million, whereas you might have been thinking, what? you know, maybe $200,000. And uh, so this is what I mean by a stretching exercise. And then on top of the subtotal, we add an overall allowance calculated at 15% of the subtotal. And that number can be, as you get firm co estimates on other costs, 
as you as you proceed, uh, that number can be lowered to 10 percent, but in my view, it should not become be any lower than that. Assuming we're assuming um, that the overrun allowance is made up half of leasehold improvements and half of equipment, but it may turn out to be different than that. So we have a total project cost of $1.5 million, um, a little over that, and we divide that by the total square feet, 6,000, and have $257 per square foot. The current typical project cost for an existing co-op to relocate is $225 to $250 a square foot, what we're seeing. In some ways, it costs more for a new co-op because you're not bringing over any inventory or any equipment from the old store. So this $257 is, is a I would call it a typical number. Uh, yes, there are projects that can be done for less, and yes, there are projects that will cost more. Uh, but this is, you know, what we're seeing is the typical range. Bill, would you like to take a couple questions on expenses before you move into the sources? Yes. I'll take at least one. At least one? Yes. Oh, I just I want to move along here. But yes. um, well, there's, there are quite a few, but how about um, answering this one? The, the example seems like a rather large store. Is there something disadvantageous or detrimental to long-term survival for being too small? Well, as the natural foods market and the grocery market as a whole is evolving, uh, it's more challenging for the smaller store to compete. And so we're seeing that a, um, you know, that a store of um, anything less than 3,500 retail square feet, you know, may, w would have extra challenges to be successful. Now, that's not to say that they can't be successful at a smaller size, and there are some markets where that would be a more appropriate size. But oftentimes we hear from groups, and I think uh, Just Food Co-op in Northfield was one where they came with their initial vision for a store, and they wanted to offer these products and these services, and they wanted to have a store of 1,500 square feet. And when you begin to lay all that out, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. In you know from a design process, so that's the basic response there. If you're going to go lower than 3,500 or 3,000 square feet of retail, you just to be very careful uh, with that. Another question, Stuart? Okay. Um, let's see. I, you caught me off guard. You said you're going to take one. Uh, <laughs> Should the operating and administrative expenses include expenses such as the feasibility study, et cetera, and how far prior to opening? And does this also include anything like advertising, mar and advertising and marketing expenses? Yeah, the, the, the admin expenses that we're showing here on line 33, $15,000, don't include the um, what you might be paying to hire you know, a consultant services to assist you with feasibility work. That those fees come out of the line 31, and uh, and then the other thing that was asked about that was included there. Um, how far ahead of opening would you foresee that expense hitting? We'll see an illustration of that when we go into the next tab here in about 10 minutes or five minutes. So. Okay. Bill, this is this is Denise, and I have a comment. Yes. On the uh, equipment, uh, the assumption here is pretty much um, uh, with uh, like new equipment. Well, on, on the cost on here, uh, yeah. particularly for refrigeration. Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's a combination of new and reconditioned equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, probably with the leaning towards uh, new equipment, but it's not. Uh, it's not recommended that you necessarily pursue used equipment that hasn't been reconditioned and that isn't warranted for you know a period of a year or longer. Uh, okay, so let's uh, take a look at the. Now we've figured out we have to spend one million five hundred forty-one thousand dollars. Where are we going to get that from? 
and uh, the sources that we're showing here are divided into three categories. I'd like you to, just from a format point of view, get an understanding of these three categories. You see, if we look down at line 58, there's, we show the owner's contribution as a category, and then line 68 is the bank debt as a category, and then in between those two categories is what is often referred to as a gap, and it's, we're calling it external and subordinated funds. Um, so that those three categories will comprise the total, and we'll go back up to the owner's contribution and show fairly quickly uh, the, the basic funds that comprise that being cash that you might raise from benefits and donations plus grants, if any, uh, and you can't get too reliant upon grants because they just not, might not be an opportunity for you, plus member equity. And the member equity in this case is assumed at 1,000 members at an average of $150 per member, although you may set a member share requirement. It might even be higher than that, but we were thinking that on an average, each member would have to be paying in $150, um, you know, within two, as early as possible, but within at least two to three months of opening. Uh, and here on line 52, I again, uh, show the number of members at the end of each stage. Um, you can work this out on your own, but uh, I, I suggest a thousand members as a as a benchmark yeah, for most startup co-ops. Uh, the last item that's part of the owner's contribution is, are the member loans. Um, this is assumed that you would raise 100 loans, get 100 loans from your, out of your 1,000 members, uh, average size loan of $4,000, minimum size loan of 1,000. Uh, it's important to seek appropriate legal and consulting advice in planning and implementing a member loan program. And it's a huge topic that we could do a full webinar on at some point. The subtotal of the owner's contribution of these four numbers adds up to 600,000 or 39% of the total. Uh, the owner's contribution should be as close to 50% or higher as possible and at least 33%. So it was a stretch to get this up to 39%. Uh, so that's what I was able to do with this draft. Going into the next category, what we, is kind of this middle category, uh, you see that these, all these sources are listed for the, all the all the sources are kind of in order of risk. That from the the very first line 48, the cash and the owner's contribution gets put at risk first. And as we work our way down to the bank debt on line 68, that's least at risk because it'll be secured with the assets of the co-op. So as we're working our way up, we, we have a landlord contribution that is factored in here. Uh, and that doesn't always happen, but if you're signing a lease, a long-term lease on a space, you should attempt to negotiate the lowest base rent possible, plus what might be called a tenant improvement allowance. Could be as much as $25 a square foot. Uh, we factored here at 25% of the leasehold improvements that we're showing up above in the uses. There's some vendor contribution in terms of vendor credit that may be possible to be negotiated with vendors, but as a startup, it's, you'll, you might typically be on a COD basis. Uh, you'll need work to negotiate and build relations with suppliers. And then free fill is if you work with um, your suppliers, you can go to manufacturers and get some of your initial inventory for free, basically, for stocking that product in your store. If you were a very large store, uh, you would have the leverage to maybe generate 50 or 70 percent of your, or 100 percent of your initial inventory as free fill, but as a startup, you won't have that leverage. So we're showing it as 15 percent. 
the then we're showing a, an amount of subordinated debt somehow from a city or community source. Again, these are difficult to identify, uh, but you may be able to find some funds that could be low interest long term, two to three percent interest, ten to fifteen years. Uh, there can be lots of hoops and red tape to go through, but a lot of times it's an important piece to bring into the project in order to leverage the other the bank financing as we go lower down here. So this next on line 66, we see the subtotal. In this case, it represents 21% of the total. Um, uh, so the adding up the owner's contribution and the external subordinated total, we have 60%, uh, and we'd like that total to be as close to 75% as possible, but at least 55. So we're over that. The bank debt then is the important piece. This is will be secured with the assets of the co-op, um, somewhere between 25 and 45% of the total, aim for 25%. Here we have it at 40%. Whether that's bankable or achievable or not is a good question, but that's what this illustration is showing. So that's a way to creatively piece together $1,541,000. And it's, you notice there are a number of stakeholders, a number of people making investments, including your members internally and others outside of the organization to do this. Uh, it's, you know, it's, again, this sources and uses budget would be supported by a financial performer that would show the ability to service the debt. So if we could then... And Bill, yes. Dean's a comment, and that pro forma then is broken down over like a period of uh, maybe five years or ten years and, and like on an annual basis or could be quarterly? Yes. Yeah, the pro forma will... Will be done on you know over an extended period of time, showing how the co-op will perform, is projected to perform, and uh, you know it'll be done. Projections will be done annually, but for the first year, you might want them done quarterly or even monthly. So, if we drop down a little bit lower here, there's one other item that's important to try to learn about. How will a bank uh, view this scenario in terms of collateral? Uh, if they view it strictly as a collateral loan, it may be difficult to get it financed, and you can illustrate that here. Each bank is different in the way that they calculate collateral, but in this case, the, if we take the equipment and value it at 70%, it translates into 273000 Assuming half of the overrun might be equipment, and value that at 70,000, or 70%, we add another 70000 and then the leasehold improvements and inventory are what might be called low-grade collateral. Maybe the banks wouldn't assign any value to them, but making a case for 35%, again, that's an unproven assumption. Uh, that shows $238,000 of collateral totaling up to on line 78 of $581,000 of total collateral and you compare that with line 68, where you're seeking a loan of 622,000. So, and again, so this scenario, the collateral is, doesn't quite measure up, and it would be say, you know, the collateral's weak here. You know, the bank would probably like to have, I don't know, 700,000 or more collateral before they would loan 622,000. Um, so you can find some banks that are might be especially tuned to making small business loans or community reinvestment programs, or there are some banks and loan funds that are especially geared to working with cooperatives. Uh, NCB um, being one of them, North Country Cooperative Development Fund, uh, New England Co-op Loan Fund, those are some examples. Uh, the loan a bank will really need to look at the loan in terms of cash flow, quality of the management, quality of the location and the market will be the primary determinants of bankability as listed on line 79. So I think we need a question. 
Okay. I've got a bunch of them for you, Bill. Okay. All right. Um, when you talk about the sources being listed in order of risk, do you mean that the top of your chart is the low risk or the high risk or vice versa? Can you? Uh, the top, of the, the top of the chart is the high risk, the money that's most at risk. Okay. So, the, so for example, the member equity money is going to be used before the member loan money. So the member, the member equity, in a worst case scenario, uh, the member loan money will go, or the member equity money will go before, you know, the member loans. If everything was liquidated and there was, you know, um, $200,000 left, you know, the, it would go to, to pay off the sources starting with the bottom source. The bank would get that $200,000. And if there were, if there were more than what was owed to the bank, then it would go basically to the next one up. Okay. Um, does the sources and uses budget include the very early costs covered in startups, like feasibility studies? And yes, it does, and we'll, that'll be something we'll be showing here very quickly as we go into the next tab. Okay. And the thirty thousand dollars representing a one-year salary, or is the thirty thousand dollars representing salary for a project manager for the co-op? or the one-time expense of a construction project manager? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it, it could vary. You know, it's a it's, uh, project manager could be, could cost $60,000. It could cost uh, $100, you know, depending on, on how the co-op looks at that and how they define that service. I think the $30,000 is a, somewhere in the middle number and it's, it would it could be a project manager that's focused on on the facility or and or it could also be a project manager that is charged with some of the early organizing aspects of the of the co-op so again we'll look at that in the next tab a little bit well when startups are starting a loan campaign um, what's some of, there's some confusion about how many members they need, and, and of course it's somewhat related to the size of co-op. But um, where is it? Somewhere between 200 and you use a thousand, I think, in this example. Yeah, and I, I, I think once you uh, get to uh, um, where you've secured the site and move into stage 3A, um, you would have. Uh, you know, you, that's where you would be launching your member loan drive and you would have 800 members at, at this point. Um, you know, you would go public with your site at the beginning of stage 3A, you'd have 800 members. And you might look at a one out of four or one out of five, um, you know, ratio for that you need, you know, four or five members in order to get one loan. So if you're launching your member loan drive with 200 members, you, you know, at, at best, could maybe get 50 loans from that. Okay. I think that, that's about what we've got for right now. Okay, let's move us along here. We're running a little bit behind where I'd like to be at this time, but we'll... I appreciate Mark uh, taking over here, and he's doing a good job. But we'll move us to the next tab now, the stage one, two, and three. We'll start up at the top left corner. And what we have here is a, a sources and uses cash flow by stage. We see that this version was drafted February 1st, 2008. And we show the stages. And hopefully by now you're getting familiar with the development model that shows the three stages and the sub-stages. So starting with column B at the top, uh, stage one being the organizing stage. Uh, and we see that that uh, is for a period of six to 12 months or longer. Stage 2A and stage 2B, the feasibility and planning stage. 
then we see, then at the end of that stage 2B, we have that dotted line where the site is secured contingent upon getting financing. And then moving into stage 3A, where you do all the design work and you attempt to raise your money and you come to what is called the final decision point, the green light, the go point. Once you cross over that line, there ain't no turning back because you have a lease that's in effect and you've signed agreements with uh, closed on bank loans and you have an agreement with the contractor. Stage 3B then is the construction period. Stage 3C, preparing for opening one month prior. And so the blue line represents the happy day of opening the store. And uh, stage 3B is the sustaining future time. And then column I represents the total and matches up with the total budget on the first tab that we looked at. We have a column for a few notes here on column G, J, but we won't look too much at that. So then working our way back to the organizing stage, and if we begin to look at the uses in stage one, and what I want you to focus on not so much is the dollar amount and say, oh, that, I don't think that's too high or I think that's too low, and certainly you can do that, but let's look at this format-wise and concept-wise so that you understand where these expenses occur and how this project flows through the stages. Uh, if we can look at uh, stage one and we're going to see some fees here that are broken down, but let's scroll down just for a moment to see the subtotal of the uses for this at $13,000 for that first organizing stage. So then let's go back up and see where out of that 13000 is spent. And we see that there's some, that perhaps the co-op has hired a project manager somewhere in that first stage and begins to pay them a little bit. That project manager is going to be focused on probably organizing, helping, helping the group get organized, helping them, you know, develop a plan for getting members, you know, things like that. Um, and then you can see, just taking this project management line as it goes through the projects, that the, the dollars are allocated more extensively as uh, you go forward. And, and as that earlier question came, I mean, you could easily you know, you could be spending more for project management or less, but I'm trying to show here what I think might be be typical, um, and it's probably too little <laughs> that, it, that it's shown here. The next item on line 11 represents some initial consulting that can be help that can be helpful in the organizing stage uh, related to your process, related to how you're organizing, how you're perhaps developing your your member equity requirements, uh, maybe having somebody on retainer, maybe having somebody there to work with you on site, you know, for a day or so as well. Um, scrolling down, we see uh, line 16, maybe that there's some training related to developing your board of directors, your governance system, uh, and that that's Again, you might have that by be telephone uh, support work uh, in this early stage. Uh, under scroll down under legal fees, that you'll probably incur some costs for incorporation. It might be two thousand, three thousand, five thousand um, dollars. You know, it's shown here as a thousand. Um, hiring expense line twenty four that you might have incur some expense and trying to attract and hire a project manager. And then uh, line 27, a miscellaneous allowance, $1,000. Um, and then we have the $5,000 for basic admin. Maybe you're renting a space. Maybe you're renting meeting room space. Um, 
you have some funds that miscellaneous uses. And then you're using some of your startup promotion budget here in that early stage on line 30. So altogether, these funds add up to $13,000. And then if we scroll down and we see the sources of where are these funds coming from, it's, it's really tough in the first stage to figure out where do you start and how do you fund your start point. And it's a, it's a big dilemma, I'm sure, for every group. Uh, this assumption shows uh, 44, line 44, cash from benefits and donations, uh, raised is $10,000, uh, grants, $5,000, and member equity, uh, 300 members at $150 each, $45,000. So the total sources in stage one is $60,000. The cash flow for the period would be the sources minus the uses, 60,000 minus 13, giving you $47,000 of cash flow in that period. Beginning cash was zero, ending cash is 47,000. The ending cash then goes over to the next column on line 60 and serves as the beginning cash there. And we'll, you know, as we look at stage 2A, we'll see that the cash for that period, line 59, was positive 13,000, giving you an ending cash of 60,000. So, I want to just illustrate a point if we just drop a little bit lower into the pink area here. And we can see that on, on stage one, uh, in, scroll up just a little bit more, Mark, if you could. There we go. So we can see on line 45, 46, the member equity came in at $45,000. But we didn't need to, none of that needed to be spent in stage one. So the member equity accumulated is 45,000, unused 45,000, so used member equity is zero. So we'll be able to see that as we go along into stage 2A, that we're needing to use, begin using that, gradually begin using that member equity money as you go through stage 2A and then stage 2B uh, on line 65 column C and column B. And then once you cross that dotted line where you think you have a feasible project, you've signed a lease agreement, then you really need to begin using that member equity. And that member equity is put at risk not knowing if you're going to get to the finish line at the end of stage 3A. So that's, in the groups that I've worked with, this is the one thing I really want to emphasize is uh, a heightened awareness of how being clear about when you will need to use your the member equity and the member loan money and then being able to be accountable to your members and communicate clearly to them you know as you're trying to get them to sign up and put their money in in advance you're going to say that well we're going to we need to have a, you know, at least 300 members by the, in the next, you know, four months to show a level of support for this co-op, and we're going to set that money aside and not use it until we get to that 300 level, and then we're going to just use it very gradually as we explore the feasibility, and so that if we reach um, the point where we try to secure a site and find we can't do that and decide we're not going to go forward, we would be in a position to return most of the member equity money, but not all of it. Every situation will be different, but you need to work through that for your situation. Comments or questions? Okay. Um, we have one. Uh, addresses this whole template, and I, I think it's an interesting one. Can, would you use this template to create your budget using the formulas in it? And is that what a start, you're recommending for a startup? 
yes, I think you can, uh, but you need to not just copy this and use these exact same numbers, but give some, you know, try to get, um, you know, a, awareness and a level of comfort with the numbers that are here and what your situation might be. And I think you'll go through many drafts to, to, to arrive at that point, but I think the template and the format here could be very useful to groups. And again, the sources and uses budget is just the first step in a series of financial planning uh, work that needs to be done. The, the financial performa is, is much more involved than this is, but you need this, as I say, this serves as the cover page, uh, the starting point. And so you need to develop this first and spend some time chewing this and digesting it. Question about financing. Uh, it seems like co-op loan funds such as North Country Cooperative Development Fund and the Cooperative Fund of New England would be logical partners for startup food co-ops. What are the advantages or disadvantages of going to conventional banks for loans? Uh, the going to conventional banks for loans can be advantageous if you have a bank that is really uh, sees, you know, your project as a as a resource and a contribution to the community and is willing to get behind it. Most often, conventional banks will view it very strictly on a, from a collateral point of view. They'll expect some type of guarantee or co-signatures uh, and, you know, the, the odds of getting finance through a local bank are, are pretty steep. Uh, the advantages of working with a co-op lender is that they're experienced in looking at these kind of projects. They can be helpful. In, in guiding the co-op and then challenging the co-op to reach certain levels of, of um, performance, you know, before being financed. And you don't necessarily get the financing any cheaper, and perhaps the opposite if you're, you know, working through a, a co-op loan fund, um, but you will get somebody who understands your project and can be there for you as you go down the challenging road of trying to open your store and get through the first three years. My own side comment on that, Bill, is that I've been hearing a lot that the smaller privately owned local banks yep. are, are more willing to be lenders for commercial businesses right now uh, yes. than some of the larger national banks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so finding a local bank in your community that is it is you know, locally owned, if possible, or you know, in your in your immediate region, uh, are going to be more inclined to make a small business loan. But you know, many of them will say, "Well, we will get you an SBA loan guarantee for this." But consumer-owned co-ops are not eligible for SBA loan guarantees. So once the bank finds out about that, then their appetite often lessens. But I, I agree with you, Stuart. This goes back a little bit, but we didn't get a chance to ask about it before. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about what the operating expenses are before a store opens? I mean, other than the pre-opening staff uh, staffing costs. Yeah. Well, there are some groups that do um, that even set themselves up as a small buying club, um, or that have. Um, you know, a series of fundraisers that where you need to, where there are some operating expenses to, to put on those fundraising events. Um, so the, what's shown here is in, in terms of the, um, um, if we look at uh, line uh, 29, um, is, um, you know, an allowance just to give you some things to, some way to cover some of your some of those miscellaneous costs, and it can include rent for office space, uh, telephone expense, uh, postage, you know, uh, mailing, and it's a fairly small amount, uh, five thousand dollars over the course of let's say twelve months. Uh, but it 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 uh, it's important to recognize that you will probably need some out of pocket dollars during that out of out of that organizing stage just to do the basic the basic, basic stuff. One more? 
Um, I think I need to move along here a little bit. Uh, I want to um, I want to illustrate here where we're at um, with the with the fees. Um, if we go over to uh, line nine, if we go over to column J, uh, we see that the scroll over just a little bit to show that the subtotal for the fees is 146,000. And then in column I, I worked with that budget uh, to say how would that $146,000 be divided up uh, going down through line 28. And I kind of identified numbers that I thought were ideal, but uh, you know, if I would have had more money, I certainly would have allocated more there for that. But I came up with a total that was greater than the than the amount listed there in column J, um, and and so I had to find thirteen thousand dollars to reduce that, and so I I created a line there, line twenty eight, saying reduction of fees to meet the budget. And so this is an example of how a group would need to manage their budget given limited resources, whatever they are, and the tension that exists between wanting to do a lot and not having all the funds to do it. So saying that, okay, in this scenario, you would need to find ways to cut out $3,000 in stage 2A, et cetera, stage 2B, and all the way over then on, on line 28, all the way over to the total column, so 13,000. And if we scroll over just a little bit to the right, we'll read the note there. To the right, of, uh, so if this reduction can't be achieved, this amount then is drawn from the overrun allowance. So those are the kind of decisions that you know I, I thought it would be important to kind of illustrate. Uh, it, it, and it, why it's important to lay out your sources and uses in a more detailed format like this, where you try to anticipate every type of fee and uh, still providing even a category called miscellaneous fees, line 27, you know, for the unexpected fees. And uh, if we scroll over to the right just a little bit there on that line and read the note, uh, this includes travel, for example, to CCMA, which is a national conference for food co-ops, and I think this year there will be a number of offerings for startup co-ops there, and includes travel as you would want to go and visit with other co-ops and work out, you know, some type of learning uh, opportunity there, or just be able to see what some other co-ops are. So. So I wanted to illustrate that the, the fees, again, not focusing so much on the specific number, um, although it's my best guess given the given trying to make a, a budget here that I think can be shown to be financially feasible, but it, it has yet to be demonstrated with financial performance. So uh, if we scroll down then to the uh, there we go, right there. I want to show the subtotal of the uses uh, as the top line mark, 41. There we go, right there, 41. Show 41 as the top line and scroll up a little bit. There we go, thank you. Um, so we can see that as we're going through the stages on line 41, the total budget increases Quite, you know, it ramps up as you're going along. Stage 2A is an additional 27,000. Stage 2B, 29,000. Oh, you go past that decision point, you commit to a space, and you really start to spend money in stage 3A. And then you make your final decision point, and that's, you know, then in stages 3B and 3C is where the dollars really pour up. And uh, stage 3D is made up mostly of that working capital allowance and the set aside for professional support in year one. Um, 
plus some inventory that you, you don't end up paying for until after the store is open. So that's the flow of the uses. And then we look down at line 57 and we see the flow of the sources coming in. And you know they, they come in fairly substantially you know, from the beginning stage. So a group needs to be focusing on raising money from its members in stage one. And uh, and then continuing to to raise that uh, in stage two, stage three A, the sources coming in jumps up quite a bit, and you see that's where the member loans come in on line 47, column E. And so the member loan program is launched after you've secured a site. Uh, you do the planning for the member loan program before back in stage 2A and stage 2B, and then launch it once you've secured the site. So we can then, we see some of these other miscellaneous sources coming in in stage 3B and 3C, landlord contribution, uh, the city community loan, you know, and then we see the bank debt beginning to be drawn in stage 3B. The rest of it is drawn in stage 3C. All the while, the ending cash position on line 61, ending cash is positive through all at the end of every stage, even though it's at the end of stage 3B on line 61 is only $10,000, so you know, that's cutting it fairly close. And then if we drop down just a little bit further into just a few places into the pink, a couple more. And then we see the, the flow of the member loans. That's uh, uh, back up a little bit if you could. So we see the member loans coming in there on line 47 on column E, and then the dropping down to line 67, the member loans have been accumulated, uh, but they're held. They're not used during stage 3A. They're not used until you get past the final decision point, and that they're then used uh, as you go into stage 3B. So on line 69, shows that $400,000 of member loans have been used, accumulated. So I think that's um, the extent of, that we're able to go through this. Um, I would like to take a question or two and then go back and look at our three goals for our learning here today. All right. Okay. Good couple of questions for you. Can you be uh, can go into a little more depth on the comment you made about having a certain number of members, I think 300, before you begin the planning process and how that money would be set aside before testing feasibility? This group is finding that prospective members want to know that the idea is feasible before they become members. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a, that is a challenge and sometimes members want to want to wait till the stores open before they become members but it's it's your job to educate your potential members of the importance of the member equity coming in and that you're as the leaders of the group are going to manage that responsibly uh, that you're going to um, show for in this case we're seeing 45,000 coming in in stage one but it is going to be held and it is going to be protected. Uh, and then as you go into stage two, depending on your other sources of funding, you may need to begin utilizing that member equity. And so you're putting some of that at risk. And members have to recognize that that they need to share some of the load in investigating the, the feasibility of this and doing the planning work for the co-op. And you know, in this event where, um, you know, a little more than 10% of the equity is 
used in stage 2A, for example. Uh, 7,500 out of the 67,500 is used, and in that case, if the co-op then reached the end of stage 2A and said, we don't have a feasible project here, they'd be able to return, you know, almost 90 cents on the dollar. And, uh, you know, I think out of $150, that's going to then cost, you know, a member, you know, 15 or $20. Uh, for their contribution in, in trying to get a co-op off the ground in your community. And if you can't get people to put that amount of money at risk, that's a good test that you're not going to be able to get to build an ownership base that's really going to responsibly carry this co-op forward into the future. So um, does that answer the question, Stuart, do you think? Um. If it doesn't, the person who asked it can shoot me a, a response. Otherwise, yeah. or in the meantime, mm -hmm. at what stage does incorporation come? Stage one, from what I understand from previous webinars, you can't collect member equity until you are incorporated. Yeah. How, how does that timing work? Yes. Uh, the incorporation would happen in stage one, and it would ho ha hopefully happen let's say midway in stage one or as early as possible in stage one as you can. So then you can begin collecting member equity after that. So in the event that stage one is going to last, let's say 12 months, you want to incorporate somewhere within the first, you know, three, three to six months of being in existence. There are a lot of issues around that and, you know, please contact us if you have questions. All right, well, they pretty much have gone through the questions we have uh, waiting. Uh, okay. oh, that's another good one. Uh, Is there, are there any good websites to find um, lessons learned on budgeting from other co-ops that are now further along in the process? I'm not aware of any that with that specific thing. Anybody else have comments on that? Yeah, I, I think um, maybe cooperative grocer articles about startups and and uh, might be in you know, often have some information at least about what their budgeting process was. Yeah. You could check their archives. Yeah. Certainly, talking with uh, any of us, we can you know provide some examples of other case case studies. Um, I want to go back to the slideshow if we can. We have, uh, could somebody clarify the time to me? We have about uh, six There's minutes five left. Minutes, no. Five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. So we haven't used the slideshow very much, but I encourage you to look through that. Uh, let's just go down to slide 11. And um, we, we see that, that, uh, that the sources and uses budget uh, has a relationship to the financial performa. Uh, sources and uses budget does not determine financial feasibility, but it, it's the cover page. Uh, it is the financial performa is then your tool to help you determine financial feasibility. Going on to slide 12, uh, the financial performa includes the following things listed there. And we won't take time to go over that. I described that earlier. Slide 13. Uh, the key indicators that you look at in financial in a financial performa are typically cash flow, profitabilities, and the key ratios. Uh, we're not able to in this webinar illustrate a financial performa, but if you wish to learn more about that or discuss that with us, please contact us. Slide 14. The, so then we show a little bit, this is a summary of what we've kind of talked through when we look through the actual illustration of the sources and uses by cash flow, um, funding for stage one, you know, the dilemma that you have in an organizing stage, the natural dilemma that you have to deal with, and it's a test for you as an organization to see if you can work your way out of that, out of that maze. And uh, 
if you can clear that hurdle, you you have you have strength in your organization, and that's going to guide you through the next stages and over the next hurdles. Uh, so the tests, in a sense, are valid. Uh, the answers there aren't easy answers, <laughs> but you you know you can figure them out, and there's a lot of people that are, will help you and provide support. Uh, so the budget for stage one could be ten to twenty thousand uh, dollars. Moving on to slide fifteen. Uh, so then we see the types of sources of funds, the types of uses of funds. Slide sixteen goes through the same thing for stage two A and two B. And then if we move along, we're just going to move very quickly here to slide 17 and slide 18 then goes into stage 3. Um, so you're seeing that a budget for stage 3A could be 80 to $100,000. The example we had was about 90000 And then slide 19. Talks a little bit about the last three substages, 3B, 3C, and 3D. And then the final slide, slide 20. Um, the it's important to monitor your sources and uses budget as you go through the stages. Uh, once you get through stage 3C, do a final tally or report comparing your actual. Um, the actual compared to the projected. And then, of course, celebrate. And then, again, realize that once you open your doors, as much fun and excitement and work as you've had to get the doors open. And there's been plenty of work, I understand. Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. The real work begins upon opening day. Go back to slide three, Mark. Okay. One moment, please. So, again, our three goals for learning today were um, understand the format and the function of the sources and use of budget within the scope of the financial performa, to understand the sources and uses in context with the four cornerstones of three stages, and understand more about the decision points of exposing member equity and member loan money and assessing the risk level. So that concludes with what I have, and I welcome contact with anybody, and I thank you all very much for your participation and uh, your your commitment to cooperative development. Bill, thanks very much. I want to remind participants that there is an evaluation that will be coming on your green, on your screen shortly. And, we'll make sure you back. and we welcome you to attend next week. And I would just jump in and add that the recording uh, for the last two sessions are on the website, and this one uh, hopefully will be up shortly. Thank you, Bill. Good job. Thank you, Mark. I'll just, yeah, a, a download call. I'll have the information. Thank Hold you. On.